Uncle Hul's idea of a vacation is visiting the palace of Jabba the Hutt. Of course, it's a working vacation. Hul wants to study the Bomar monks who live in the tunnels beneath the palace. If Jabba isn't enough to give Zack and Tash nightmares, the monks should do it. The most enlightened monks don't have bodies. They're just brains in jars. Brains in jars that walk around on robotic legs. Worst of all, one of the monks is mad. Not just angry mad, but out of his mind mad. And if Tash isn't careful, she just might lose her head. Hello, younglings, and welcome back to the Library of Fear. That's right. That's right. We're back in the Galaxy of Fear, Galaxy of Fear number seven, The Brain Spiders by John Whitman. We are, of course, I should have mentioned this before, the Star Wars Junior Novel Podcast, and I am Junior Jedi Librarian Levi Peretic, and with me is Junior Jedi Librarian Tim May. Hey, everybody. So... <laughs> Listen, there's uh, a lot of scary stuff in this book. The Brain this book spiders. is this book is particularly scary in my opinion. So this it's book, probably the yeah. scariest Galaxy of Fear. I would say. I think so. I it's agree. The most traditional, just like horror, creepy, you know, invasion mm-hmm. of body snatchers type shit. So mm-hmm. we'll get to that. Um, before that, though, and you have a segment you want to do. That we'll do right before the break, but. Yeah, we'll I, do that. And also, uh, also, I want to apologize real quick. I want to apologize real quick to the listeners if my audio is terrible. I have to sit outside because of cell service issues. Uh, the wind is blowing. There is a dam, a literal roaring dam across like the way from me. So you may hear some well, water rushing by. And I, I don't under- hear it, so hopefully it's okay for the listeners. But you I, know, I, I, I hope so. But if, you, if it's not we being do- picked up on your phone's microphone, it probably is okay with your real mic okay all right well let's i hope so too so <laughs> all right anyway <laughs> this, uh, this show so much work goes into this show <laughs> okay so anyway i uh the last week you know last week i was talking all about star trek and i am still all mm-hmm. about star trek listen you know it's everything that f- it fuels me i got the next generation s- complete series on blu-ray for my birthday and I've just been ramming through the hours on hours on hours of special features. There's so many special features. It's crazy. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the other thing I did, though, over the last week is I read a bunch of the recent Marvel Star Wars comics. Like, a lot of them. Mm-hmm. I read... There have been... Well, now they're on their third Darth Vader series. But I read the first two, which were 25 mm-hmm. issues each. And I've read, like, a bunch of the just Star Wars book. And uh, the first Darth Vader series takes place after New Hope. And the second Darth Vader series takes place after Sith. Uh, Okay. I would say there's a few things about these comics. I liked them. I like them overall. Um, You know, they they have kind of an annoying modern comics issue of just being very, like, obscenely fast-paced to the point where you're reading issues in, like, five minutes. But Mm -hmm. I'm reading them on Marvel Unlimited, so it's not like I'm getting ripped off. So, that's fine. So, anyway, the other thing is, uh, the second series, the one that takes place after Sith, uh, Mm -hmm. is, you know, a lot about Vader hunting down Jedi and stuff. There's a whole arc about him hunting down Jocasta Nu. Wow! Yes! (laughs) (laughs) Jocasta Nu is, like, trying to, like... She's putting all of her knowledge that she knows from her library into all these holocrons and trying to save them. And then mm-hmm. 
Like, but then there's something she needs from the temple, so she tries to go back to the temple. Big mistake. Huge. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, as Julia Roberts once said. So, yeah, and, <laughs> and, um, and I was just... Uh, but yeah, no, it's actually pretty good. The one thing I'll say about these comics is the art is... Uh, I think there's... Clearly, Lucasfilm has a big hand in who the artists are, because I think mm-hmm. there's two requirements clearly, that are being placed upon these artists. One is that they uh, are able to keep a monthly schedule, which is, you know, mm-hmm. not not something a lot of current comic book artists are capable of, let's be real. <laughs> and then two is that they, like, that the characters look like the actors. Right, that's important. Eh, is it, though... Like, I mean that they look like the actors. They want them to look, like, very much like... So, they'll mm-hmm. use a lot of photorealist artists. Mm. So, like, Salvador La Roca, who I have complicated feelings about. He, he I liked him a lot when he did X-Men back in the 2000s. I think he did Extreme X-Men with Chris Claremont. Deep cut for all you X-heads out there. And then, uh, he did... But his most famous run, and one I actually like, is his Iron Man run with Matt Fraction that went for a long time. But this guy is very fast, but he, like, Iron Man in that Iron Man run looks like Josh Holloway from Lost. And <laughs> it, it, it's very distracting. You're like, it's just Josh Holloway is playing Tony Stark in this uh, uh, in this run. But anyway, that would so be he an interesting that. choice. I think he would, would be a, a fine choice. In a pre-Robert Downey Jr. world, he kind of redefined the character because the character was not mm-hmm. quite as like quippy prior mm-hmm. to Downey. Like if you read old Iron Man comics, like he's a very good casting for it, but like the quipping is a little is not quite as heavy pre-movie mm-hmm. Iron Man. So I actually, and you know, not that like Holloway is not capable of that, but I actually. I actually think he would have been cool casting. This this book started, I think, right before the movie came out, so it's kind of the last major Iron Man story that's not like tainted mm-hmm. by like we got to make this sound like Robert Downey Jr. all the time. Um, <laughs> so anyway, whatever. Salvador Larocca is um, a fine artist, but then the second artist on the second Darth Vader series is Giuseppe Kemencoli, and I have a lot of takes on Giuseppe Kemencoli. That I'm sure all the listeners are excited to, to hear about. <laughs> they sure so, are. Giuseppe Kemencoli is a very, very good uh, comic book artist. He came to my attention when he was doing Hellblazer, John Constantine Hellblazer, uh, mm-hmm. back in the day. The Vertigo book, when it was actually about that character and it wasn't just like cool, dark magician with an attitude bullshit <laughs> that he is now. But like we're talking real John Constantine. And so, um, he he did the last stretch of issues on the actual classic Hellblazer book with Peter Milligan. And he was awesome on that. I think he inked himself on those. And his work was great. At the same time, he was doing a run on Amazing Spider-Man. And I was always like, this artwork is so much worse in Amazing Spider-Man. And it was, he had other inkers. I don't know if he was on Hellblazer or if he just had a different set of inkers. But whatever. Mm-hmm. The inkers he has at Marvel make a lot of his characters look really doofy very often. And I, I spent the last week sending you several <laughs> images of Sheev Palpatine from this run. Dude, yes. Where he just, <laughs> he looks absurd. <laughs> I, I posted one of them and, on uh, Instagram. The one the one where I took the photo because it was just like a half face of Sheev and I mirrored it so oh, it was the full face. <laughs> yeah. So funny. I was laughing so hard when you sent that back to me. So yeah, check out the Instagram <laughs> for an example. No shots at Giuseppe Kevin Cole. He's actually like one of my favorite comic book artists, at least the Hellblazer Giuseppe. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, you know, he's also very fast. Like he did, he was doing Amazing Spider-Man and Hellblazer like at the same time, and was like keeping them both on schedule, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. So I get it. Whatever. And then the regular Star Wars book is fine. My only thing with these is I'm enjoying them, but yeah, they feel slight in and of themselves, but then once you read the whole thing, you're like, oh, that was a worthwhile time. Like, I was able to read entire runs in, a, in like, a few hours. That's, mm-hmm. that, you know, as a, as a, I prefer slightly denser comic book storytelling. Like, I, I don't need, like, 
Silver Age style expl- uh, explication, but anyway, so that's my Star Wars material for the week. Doesn't, Can you believe it? I can't believe it. I mean, no Star Trek. It's insanity. Um, now, in those comics, doesn't Darth Vader have like an evil C three PO and like an R two D two like kind of thing? Yes. Well, he's. They're not really his droids. They're Doctor Aphra's droids. Oh, okay. Doctor Aphra All right. is uh, a. A. Uh, an archaeologist who of questionable morals, and she's a cool character. I have I'm going to read her solo book. Pe- people really I'm, like her, so I yeah. know she's pretty popular. I like her a so. lot. She's introduced in the Vader book, and I liked her a lot. So I'm going to read the solo book at some point in the near future. But, um, yeah, they're really her droids, though. They're not even her droids. Like, they're funny, but they're all the joke gets kind of old pretty quick. <laughs> like oh it's a c3po loves torturing people like that's the whole joke <laughs> and like it is funny like the first several times but eventually it's just like okay yep got it <laughs> we get it we got it it's a <laughs> one-dimensional character so uh, <laughs> but yeah no uh these books are fun though like i i don't want to by the way the the writers on the those two books were kieran gillen for the first series and then uh, Charles Soule for the second series, so just yeah, you know, want to give credit where credit's due. So mm-hmm. uh, you had a segment idea that kind of ties yes. into this book because this book largely takes place at Jabba's palace. If you didn't know, right? This and book, so, uh, what what I really appreciate about this book is the fact that it like it takes such an obscure creature of Jabba's palace, the brain spiders, which are really only seen in one shot. When uh, 3PO enters the palace, you know, it scoots out and then it goes, ooh, and, you know, <laughs> so, so, but I think this book utilizes those characters in a way that's, like, really interesting, and uh, so I was really impressed by that, so I wanted to do a segment where we, uh, where we each salute uh, a character that we do think deserves recognition from Jabba's Palace. Uh, you, however, did not participate in this salute. I have an idea. <laughs> I have an idea. You do yours, and we'll see if I can half-ass one before the Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, well, before I get into it, I discovered a character that I didn't know. Have you ever heard of the Light Man? No. Okay. The Light Man is actually not in the movie. The idea for the Light Man was that he was an alien that was, con- like, he was a luminous, like, being of, like, light. So what they did was they took a scuba suit and they covered it in light bulbs and they gave it like real dangly arms but it's just literally a dude walking around with light bulbs on him and this character was supposed to like lead c-3po through the palace like as like a guide and then in post they would like rotoscope over him and like actually make him this luminous creature however they just didn't even they didn't even bother to do it they just gave up on it very early on they shoot Uh, it or they shot it. It is shot. I actually just That's posted not it on in the, the Twitter. Scenes, right? No, it's not. There's like uh, I just posted on uh, the Twitter and Facebook a very uh, very blurry clip of this, and it's literally just this just be this guy in a light suit just like walking past the frame. Uh, there's a couple photos of it. It's very silly looking. You should uh, check them out. But uh, that sounds great. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, I've never I never heard of him until I saw the photo. I'm like, what is that? So that's the light man. Uh, but he is not the character that I wrote a salute to, Tim. I wrote a salute to unidentified mercenary pilot force kicked by Luke Skywalker. <laughs> <laughs> And here is what I wrote. I wrote I wrote out an actual thing for him. In a cinematic universe that notoriously rewards characters with names and expanded universe lore for merely standing in the background of a single shot, I am shocked that you, unidentified mercenary pilot, have been denied such treatment. <laughs> A man runs past Lando Calrissian carrying an ice cream machine, and he gets a name, an action figure, and a personality and traits section on his Wikipedia page. You get a poorly, you get a poorly choreographed kick to the face from Luke Skywalker, and you get nothing. <laughs> per- perhaps there's a higher conspiracy. 
Perhaps in 1982, Richard Marquand brought George Lucas into the editing room with a severe problem. Perhaps he showed George the footage, nervously biting at his nails, expecting George to cast him back into the realm of non-existence for his mistakes. Perhaps George laughed at Richard's fear. He knows who's really directing this movie, George thought. And then he declared the kick to be a force kick, thus solving Richard's blunder. (laughs) However, before leaving the room, George turned around and he said, that character, he gets nothing. (laughs) (laughs) Incredible stuff. (laughs) And with that unlikely tale, I salute you, unidentified mercenary pilot. Perhaps the Lucasfilm Story Group can give you the name that you are owed when they publish Return of the Jedi from a certain point of view in 2023. Oh, they need to get on that. Oh. That's wild. Yeah, that is actually very surprising. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Yeah, because I was like going, I was going, I was on uh, Wikipedia and found a list of like characters from Jabba's Palace, and it was arranged by the good, the bad, and the goofy. And <laughs> at the bottom of the goofy was unidentified mercenary pilot, and I'm like, who's this guy? And he's the one who gets kicked by Luke. So we should make this a <laughs> weekly thing. We can alternate, and it doesn't have to be Jabba's Palace. Okay, Just some background character. I will do one next week. I like that. Um, okay, we should definitely do that. That's very fun. All right, cool. Yeah, so <laughs> hope you guys like that because we're <laughs> gonna serve up more of it, and that's much easier than any of these sketches that we used to do. Or... Yeah, you agree. <laughs> it's I just agree. we write an essay and we read it on the air. Um, it also kind of like solves our like. Remember how we had that segment? I like that Wikipedia, and like yes. that went nowhere too. <laughs> just yeah. like well, what, are you gonna what do? was our the Yoda segment changes. called? It, it morphs. What's up? <laughs> What was our Yoda oh, yeah. segment so, called? The Yoda one? I can't remember the name of that. It wasn't yeah. called anything. Did we have a name for that one? We just... Oh, no, okay. We, we were just like, weird Yoda syntax. And then I played a clip for, like of him saying, begun this Clone War has. Because <laughs> <laughs> even though that's not the weirdest syntax in any of the movies, it's just the funniest Yoda line, I feel like. Easily. It is. <laughs> um, Did I ever tell you... Uh, have I ever told you the story about me going to see the first showing of Revenge of the Sith at our theater? You probably have. I, I feel like you definitely have, but not on the show. So. Okay. Well, anyway, at our theater, the theater had just opened. It was a brand new theater, and like Revenge of the Sith was one of their first big showings. So they were having. They had a Yoda bust, like one of those big full size Yoda bust in the lobby, and you could win it. And the way that it was won was that before each showing, uh, somebody who worked there came into the theater, and they had a Yoda impersonation contest, and it was crowd judged. And anybody could volunteer, and it was just by applause, and whoever won got their name entered into, like, the raffle to win it. And I remember there was this kid, very young kid, and he comes up to the microphone, and he goes, Begun the Clone Wars has! Like, he did it in the (laughs) deepest voice ever. Like, it sounded nothing like Yoda. Like, it was terrible. And this kid was, like, I don't know, maybe, like, seven years old. And then, of course, this 30-year-old dude in a Hawaiian shirt comes up, does, like, a spot-on Yoda impression. He wins, and the kid ends up crying (laughs) because he lost. Oh, my God. And then the kid had to sit through Revenge of the Sith, just sad. Oh, like I hope it didn't ruin that his experience. So, but experience. all right. So <laughs> he probably thinks about losing that every time. Like <laughs> he's what now? Like twenty-two years old. Jesus yeah. fucking Christ! <laughs> 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 all right. So this week, like we mentioned, we're covering the Brain Spiders by John Whitman, Galaxy of Fear number seven. Um. Before the break, I just want to say one thing: fuck eBay, mm-hmm. fuck their, fuck their bullshit oh. seller protections, fuck the fact that they side with the buyer every goddamn time, fuck them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I won't go into details, but had a very but annoying I, I, experience needs, this last week. 
I know you did. You were telling me about this. There needs to be a way to like punish like bad you buyers like that, but like eBay, feedback. you can't. Exactly. Like you can only give them positive feedback, which makes no it's sense. They just want to get it people makes, to keep absolutely. buying. That's all it is. Anyway, mm-hmm. whatever. When we come back, the brain spiders. <laughs> Stay tuned, everybody. <laughs> Welcome back to Padawan Library. My name is Tim May. I'm here, as always, with Levi Paratic. Levi? Hello. Hello, hello, hello. All right. So, this week, as I mentioned, The Brain Spiders, <laughs> Book 7 of Galaxy of Fear. Uh, book 6 kind of wrapped up the what had been the ongoing story in Galaxy of Fear. Mm-hmm. So this is kind of a, not a reboot, but like now the kids know Tash and Zack, they know all about Uncle Hul's past. He's kind of redeemed himself. They're now kind of moving on, traveling the galaxy. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but, 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 the Empire's after him, right? Right. And so they're on exactly. some rando planet. Tash has some interaction with this, uh, Mean man, what's his name? Name, Carcass. Carcass, great. <laughs> with a K, two Ks. <laughs> Carcass. So he, she interacts with this Rob Liefeld character, and then uh, they and he gets mean, and then they they leave. Uh, and I, what was the reason who had to go see Jabba the Hutt? Well, because um, in the past. The reason him oh, yeah. and Jabba have a connection is that Jabba once erased like his imperial record, and he's he's going back to ask Jabba to do that again for him and the children. So, so that's the whole that's the whole point of going back. to They Jabba's head to palace. Tatooine. They land at Mos Eisley. They rent a spa- uh, They rent a speeder, travel out to mm-hmm. Jabba's palace, greeted by Bib Fortuna, who hisses at them a bunch, and then they go in, and in this time there's an imperial officer who has a funny name i'm blanking on what it was uh i think it's fuzzle fuzzle so this <laughs> yes, fuzzle imperial it's fuzzle officer fuzzle he uh he's meeting with jabba because jabba's been sending in all these bounties right like jabba's like mm-hmm. actually turning in all these criminals and so it's like well that's kind of a weird thing for jabba to be doing yeah he's helping the he's helping the empire which is very like huh that's very weird and so then Hool asks jabba he's like hey can you give me can you erase my me from the empire's records slice into their records as we know mm-hmm. how they say it mm-hmm. slice in there and uh erase any record of me or my or or my niece and nephew here and Jabba's like, yeah, you can do it as long as you translate this scroll that I got here. Mm-hmm. And this scroll is this ancient text of, what is it, the Bahul? Uh, is it, or is it the, I mean, it belongs to the Bomar, the Bomar monks is who the, it belongs yes, to. Yes, you're right, the Bomar monks. And the Bomar monks, if you guys don't know, are these monks, this ancient, you know, you know, uh, monastery, I well, guess, on Tatooine. That is where that that that's where uh, Jabba Jabba's palace is. Like essentially an old temple of theirs, and he's just occupied it. Um, and but they're like pretty chill about it. Weirdly, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. He and Jabba just lets them like live in like the tunnels underneath the palace and do their own thing. Jabba's palace is actually for like. Seems kind of chill, if that makes any sense. Because, like, people can just, like, hang out there. He offers Hul and the children, like, each... He gives the children their own room, and he gives Uncle Hul his own room, so, yeah, too. Like, like, he puts them up it's for wild. nothing, so... so. Who, like, but Job obviously wants to have something up on, on these tenets of his. The, the <clears throat> Right, so... And so he has... So he, he asks Hul to uh, translate this ancient text that he's stolen from them. And now, before we get any further, can we talk about the brief Boba Fett cameo in this book? Mm. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so, so they walk into the palace, and uh, Zach sees Boba Fett there, and he goes up to Boba Fett, and he's like, "Hey, do you remember me? You saved me from Doctor Evazon on uh, whatever that Necro planet was." Necropolis, and, uh, I 
Necropolis, yep, and Boba Fett just ignores him. And I was thinking, oh, well, great, maybe Boba Fett will come back into the story later and help the children out. No, Boba Fett never shows up again. <laughs> so, There's a lot of weird, very like, f- <laughs> very, like, direct references in this book to the movies that, like, don't pay off at all. Um, right. Yeah, it's very odd. But anyway, so what are the monks called again? The Bahul? They are the Bomar the Bomar, the Bomar monks. Bomar Bomar. All right, so basically, uh, yeah, they're they're put. Hul agrees to this deal, and they're being and so Zach and Tash and Zach and Tash are having a little bit of a tiff. Tash is getting older. She's like, Zach's my little kid brother. I don't want to hang out with him anymore. And, and Zach, she's like, gonna be four. She's she's gonna be fourteen soon. She's gonna be an adult soon. And and that's 12. why she doesn't want to be hanging out with kids. Yeah, he's twelve, two kids. years, man. He's a two child. years younger kid is is a lot. To be fair, that's around yeah. the last time where two years seems like that much. Like <laughs> you, once you get to like once you hit sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, then like two years in either direction seems you know, yeah, maybe you mm-hmm. feel a little younger, a little older, but it's not that. Right, uh, but these except, are, li- these except, are kids except, at the precipice ex- except of becoming if the people they're going to be. Unless you're like a creep who's like over eighteen, like say you're twenty. Well, I'm and not you're talking like, about or, sexually. No. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Okay, all right. <laughs> I, I'm well, just I was saying think that's like, when it's weird. Yeah, no, whatever. I, I'm not talking about it in a romantic context. I just mean like I know. I, uh, you know, age starts to feel closer the older you get is is is, mm-hmm. is all i'm saying like specifically when we're talking of differences of one two or three years like in my 20 i'm i'm 20 i'm gonna be 29 at the end of the month uh mm-hmm. i don't feel any different from a 27 year old or a 31 year old really like that's all i'm saying right <laughs> um, I, I got no, you. like I big got you. difference all right so right. <laughs> uh, but when you're 14 and 12 that feels like a huge mm-hmm. difference. Uh, so anyway, they're having all these problems, and then um, there's uh, well, they go this, to meet uh, the monks. Yeah, they go to meet the monks. They right. meet a young monk, a boy by the name of Brother Beadlow, uh, and uh, he uh, he's basically like an orphan who joined the monastery, and then. Um, They walk in, he's like, oh, I'll go introduce you to the other monks. And then, like, he and Tash and Zach walk in on one of their brain transference operations, which is very scary. It's like a room lined with jars with brains. And uh, they run out of there, and then Beadlow is like, okay, here, I'll take you to somebody who's a little nicer than these other monks. I'll take you to uh, Brother Grimpen. Grimpen. and uh, Brother Grimpen. Grimpen. Brother Grimpen and Brother Grimpen immediately like singles out Tash and Tash, unsurprisingly, because she has a th- she has a weakness for men. I've in these well, books. not men. Period. And she has a weakness for spiritually promising. Yes, like, like mm-hmm. men who promise F- force- spiritual enlightenment of any sort. Yes, she's like yes. Grimpen Horslow, is one of those. Luke, mm-hmm. Luke. Uh, yep. And, and, and now but, uh, Grimpen. And uh, Grimpen does a nice job on page 38 and 39 of, like, explaining their lore. And uh, I'll read that to you. So, But I'll start with this Tash moment. Grimpen looked into her eyes. She felt like she would fall deep, it, it fall into the deep blue uh, of his gaze as he said, I think knowledge should be for everybody. Wisdom may be found in many places. You, for instance, I sense that you are wise beyond your years. Zach groaned inwardly. Why was this monk trying so hard to compliment Tash? And then Zach said aloud, What's all this about brain transference anyway? Grimpen explained, It's part of the Bomar tradition. We seal ourselves off from distractions so that we can concentrate more on the mysteries of the universe. Over the years, we've become more and more enlightened. When we reach a certain stage of enlightenment, our brains are transferred out of our bodies into glass jars. So we saw, Zach said, and I guess sometimes those jars are attached to spider droids? 
Correct, Grimpen said. That allows the enlightened ones to move around and experience different surroundings while remaining detached from the world. That way the enlightened can continue to think without distractions like hunger or sleep. The brain spiders uh, take care of that for them? Zack asked, impressed. The droids keep the brains alive and healthy. Since you and I have bodies, we have to worry about eating and sleeping and getting tired. We get cold and hot. Inside the brain jars, the enlightened monks don't have to worry about any of that. Can they talk? Zack asked, curious about the technology. Grimpen shook his head. It's possible to give them electronic voices, but Jabba the Hutt controls the palace. He grew tired of hearing the Enlightened Ones try to teach him their lessons, and he ordered all of their voice boxes removed. Now all the Enlightened Ones can do is think about the ultimate truth of the galaxy. So that's uh, that's what they so, do. Yeah. What's interesting is that, you know, you might be like, something's up with these guys, and there is, mm-hmm. but also there's not. So... I think it's actually a sort of interesting way that Whitman deals with this. Uh, yes. But anyway, so basically Tash is all about this. She wants to learn more. and uh, But first they go back to see Uncle Hool. Uncle Hool's like, listen, Jabba just said that they can't slice into the computers of the Empire anymore. Uh, and the only thing he's going to offer now is, is new identities. And he's like, I don't know if I want to fuck with that. And like, the kids are like, what are you talking about? That sounds perfect. And he's just like, I don't know. I'll have to think about it. But he's clearly leaning towards nah, be so. <laughs> Kill me. And that is, me. That's, kind um, of explained, <laughs> that's kind of explained later, it too. Does, so it we'll gets get explained. Into that, um, <laughs> so anyway, so then the next day, uh, Tash goes back to see Grimpen. Grimpen's like, yo, check out these hot coals. If you, you can control... <laughs> your mind and you won't even feel pain man when you walk across these hot coals my dude and so she runs across them like pam in the office and then there's Mm -hmm. like uh uh except pam actually did it the reveal coming soon yeah (laughs) yeah Mm -hmm. Uh, shouts to pam (laughs) (laughs) and uh (laughs) and then uh and so, like, and, but, like, Zach's like, nah, man, this sucks. I'm not doing this. And, like, Tash is like, good. You're my little baby brother. I want you to out- get out of here. So then we follow Zach. And Zach uh, kind of, like, diddles around the palace a bunch. And then he winds up, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, just winding up in a prison cell where he gets locked in. Yes. And you're like, what the hell's going on here? And so then he sees this guy who's, like, He's like, this guy doesn't seem like a criminal. I'm going to let him out. <laughs> yeah. Let's the guy out. And uh, then Bib Fortuna sees him and is just like, what are you doing here? And he's like, uh, and Zach's like, I, I lost, got lost. He's like, where's the other prisoner? He's like, I don't know. And then Bib Fortuna's like, ah, go back to your room. And so he goes back to his room. And then, um, and then, what was it? Well, this okay. is, uh, we can get into... This is the moment where, like, um, I don't know if this is the moment, but, like, Hool offers some wholesome advice oh, yeah, to Zach. Oh, yeah, Because, yeah, because Zach, um, he, um, he, uh, he's complaining about uh, Tash and the fact that, like, she's treating him like a child. And um, this is, like, actually a really nice Hool moment. I think it's one of the best we've had. So it's on page 77 if you want to follow along at home. Zack, Hool said gently, you know I don't have much experience as a parent, or even an uncle. I have always been too busy with my research, so it would be wrong for me to try to be a parent now. But, he continued, I think I can help you by telling what I've noticed as an anthropologist. Humans of Tash's age need to feel grown up. They want to find new friends and new ways to have fun. They change. Hool pointed at Zack and then himself. I have always found it very strange the changes humans go through during their lives. We, Shido, do not do that. Our personalities never change. Humans never change their shape, but their personalities are always changing. Sometimes happy, sometimes sad, always finding new interest. Shido, however, change shape all the time, but our personalities remain the same from the day we were born. It's what makes us who we are. Zach was amazed. Hull had never spoken about himself anything this personal. Hull continued, There is an old saying among the Shido, no matter how many times we change shape, 
we always look like ourselves to those who know us. It means whatever shape I choose, my true friends will be able to recognize me. He put a hand on Zach's shoulder. What is my true appearance is true for ta- what is the true what is the true for my appearance is true for Tash's personality. I am sure that if you look closely, you will find Tash you always knew. Zach could hardly believe his ears. Hool had always tried to protect his niece and nephew. Several times, he even risked his own life to save theirs. But Zach always thought was Hool was doing it because he had to do it, not because he wanted to do it. Realizing that Hool really did care for him, Zach took the words to heart. Maybe Hool was right about Tash, and if he was right, and if he was right, then their friendship could last whatever Tash was going through. So, yeah. like, who will give who will give some good advice there? Yeah. Uh, but however, Daddy Hool. this Daddy, Hool. what's Hool's first name? We learned Hool's first name in the last book, and I can't remember it. And this book does not readdress it like the other books it's would. What it is, it doesn't. It's... <laughs> <laughs> we'll remember when we need so, to remember. Yes. So there's this whole moment where like Tash is. Um, one of their another one of the Bomar trials of enlightenment is to go out to the pit of Carcoon and walk around the perimeter of the Sarlacc. Tash does this. Zack runs out to save her, to stop her, which then causes her to fall into the pit. One of the Sarlacc's tentacles grabs her. Zack has to save her, uh, which he does. And, but then, like, Tash is, like, pissed about it, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. Uh, but but they apologize eventually. She calms down. and But then there, there's another moment, though, where they're in their room, and, like, Ta- Zack goes to say something, like, playful to her, and Tash lays a hand on Zack, and Zack knows that there is something, oh. something very, very wrong here. So, yeah, at, all at this point, like, um, yeah, because that night, uh, Hool's like, yeah, I'm not taking Jabba's offer, because, like, I'm, listen, I, I'm a Shido, I'm a shapeshifter, I gotta I keep am. control of my own identity, like, if I change mm-hmm. my identity all willy-nilly, like, I won't be able to stay true to myself. Is what he's saying. So that's interesting, kind of. And then, uh, so he's rejecting the offer, but like, you know, but he's like, we're going to leave tomorrow. You guys get a good night's sleep. Like, stay in your fucking room for once. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so, but then Tash sneaks out and steals a land, steals a speeder and heads mm-hmm. towards Moss Eisley. And so, uh, the homie Zach uh, follows <laughs> follows her and uh, sees that she goes into some weird cantina. Hang on, hang on. There's a whole part here we have to cover before okay. this because it involves Fuzzle. Oh yeah, Fuzzle comes back to. Okay, so there's a moment in the book where Zach sees yeah. Carcass again. Yeah, he sees Carcass again, and him this and was Jabba when he was cons- in the prison cell. I forgot to mention this. Right. Yes, and they're conspiring something. Zach doesn't know what. Fuzzle comes back, and he's demanding, you know, there's a huge bounty on, uh, on Carcass's head, and Jabba presents to him Carcass's body, and, like, he gives it up, and Jabba's like, well, I better get that, uh, you know, I better get those credits in my account by tomorrow, and Fuzzle's like, you'll get them. So anyway, flash forward to Mos Eisley. Tash gets out of her speeder, meets a guy in an alleyway and then kills him. And this and and Zach runs over after Tash has run away and it the man she kills is Fuzzle and there's a K carved into his head. A K for Carcass, the signature so, of Carcass's killings. So, the brain spiders clearly got a hold of uh, the prisoner that Zach let go was supposed to be mm-hmm. Carcass's new body as designed by the brain spiders. I don't know. And, uh, <laughs> and so uh, since he let the prisoner go, uh, they decided let's go with Tash. Um, mm-hmm. And so anyway, they come back and, uh, and basically uh, Hool is like, I'm going to go say goodbye to Jabba, pay my respects. Then we're getting the fuck out of here. And in this moment, Zach's, like, trying to tell Hool all about 
what he thinks is going on, and and Hul's like, we can talk about it when we're off the planet. And and Zach's like, I don't know, I don't think that's Tash, so we need to go. So, he goes to, uh, he, he goes and runs to find uh, Grimpen. <laughs> Great name. <laughs> brother, brother, brother Grimpen. Grimpen. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so he... <laughs> I love it. <laughs> the respectable Brother Grimpen. <laughs> oh. Anyway, so he goes to find Brother Grimpen, and Brother Grimpen is just full on, like, he's thrown off any potential nice guy shit. He is, he is just pure evil now, and he's like, yeah, of course Tash is... I, I took Tash's brain out and put it in a spider, and then put a mass murderer's brain inside of her. No shit! That's what I do. I serve Java. Yep. Like, fuck all these other monks. Like, I'm going to, like, live that sweet life with Java by, like, providing mm-hmm. Java with, uh, bod- with, uh, with, with uh, bodies for, uh, for these criminals to find new identities. So, uh, and, like, and this is, like, I love this plot because this feels like such a Jabba plot. Jabba is getting criminals to pay him so that he could put their brain in another body, and then Jabba collects the bounty on their body. Like, He's just like <laughs> classic Jabba. He wins no matter what. So ma- he wins both ways. So yeah, he's like just flowing into Jabba's <laughs> gullet. So, anyway, um, so, yeah, he reveals this pretty easily. Hul then shows up and is like, yeah, nah, this is trash, my guy. Uh, and, uh... <laughs> but this is also a classic cool moment because they roll, they they bring Hul in and he's like knocked out, and they're gonna put like uh, oh, yeah. uh, Carcass's brain into Hul's body, and then Hul gets up and he's like, "Nice try, my boys. I'm a Shido," <laughs> oh, <laughs> and like so just true. wrecks all of them. And so all the other brothers, <laughs> they found out about this. They're not happy with Grimpen, but they're also like, "Why should we like?" Uh, put uh, Tash's brain back in her body like she'll just like she's just gets she, to chill and contemplate in- existence forever man and so uh, but then Hul's just like listen I got this scroll that Jabba gave me he stole it from you I'll return it to you uh, if you do that for me if you put her brain back in her body mm-hmm. but if you don't I will fucking like disseminate this all over the world Everyone's gonna know about all your brain transference. They're gonna know about your little tricks, like the, like the not real hot rocks. Yes, the what they are called. They are called loom rocks. So yeah, yeah glow, Tash never actually but, walked over a hot coal. So it just yeah. makes somebody feel like they're like stunning, you know, uh, like they they have such <laughs> control, you know. And so anyway, I uh, and so they're like, okay, oh shit. We'll do that, and then they uh, then they leave the planet. They're gone, mm-hmm. and Grimpen is left to be dealt with by the rest of the brothers. And Jabba is like, "Guess that scheme's over." Dar- gosh darn it! And that's the end of the book. <laughs> yep. And and Grimpen and Grimpen is uh, his. Uh, he ends up as a brain on a shelf, and he wants oh, to yes, like scream was, out, but yes. he can't. So yep. So that's like. A classic moment. I will say this. Um, this is a personal thing uh, with me. I have always found this type of like brain science fiction always kind of unnerving. Uh, it's always kind of irked me in a way because the idea of like having your brain pulled out and then put in a jar is like you are defenseless kind of thing. Sure. And then to be like kept alive has always really bothered me. Have you ever seen Brain Damage with uh, Bill Pullman? Oh yeah, I have actually. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah that's right. that's kind that's of a, mm-hmm. that's that's always. Mm-hmm. I find that all like, always bothered. body snatcher or like yeah brain sucking like that kind of stuff is always very disturbing to me. Yeah, it's always and that's what always uh, bothered me about RoboCop two. All of like the Kane's brain stuff in that has always really bothered me. And for and for this specific reason, I am not an organ donor on my license oh. because I don't want my brain scooped out and put in a You'll jar. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. what you think. If they get that brain out quick enough, it might not be. You know, like okay. 
<laughs> do what so. do whatever you need to do. Uh, anyway, but the, uh, uh, <laughs> all right, so yeah, this book. But I, uh, I did think it was creepy. It's the creepiest of these books. It's the, like which is the stated mm-hmm. goal in a lot of ways of Galaxy of Fear. So in some ways it should get a higher grade, but I will say the character stuff I thought was pretty pedestrian. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I enjoyed Jabba, the Java stuff. The monks were kind of fun. I didn't get a chance to look up and see if the monks were featured in any other Star Wars stuff. Um, I th- I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure. I didn't look at that either. I should have. But, but um, if they're not, it's a funny one-off that, like, this is the only. Mm-hmm. But if if it's not a one off, I don't want to assume that. Um, but but like what I like about this book is that like I said it earlier, like John Whitman takes this super obscure character and like he fleshes it out. Now whether or not he came up with the lore of the Bomar monks is beyond me. We should have looked into this. We should have done our research. <laughs> Instead, I was researching unidentified mercenary pilot. That's fine. Uh, that's but fine. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but I think that's like it's a real creative use of these characters, and like this fits perfectly for this book series. So yeah. So but continue um, your thoughts. I'm, I'm going to go for this series. Certainly, I think this is a seven point five, maybe. Out of okay. 10. All right. Uh, solid material. Uh, you know, in general, I, I you know, I Galaxy of Fear is like one step below. Usually, like I'm basing, I'm grading it against itself. So for 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 this series, mm-hmm. it's fairly high, but. I'd probably go closer to like a six point five, just as a general grade. But okay, I I think this is so far the best book in the series we've read in terms of just like general like creepiness, and uh, it's hard to say if this will continue that or not. I do like that this is mostly like a standalone book that like the ma- we got this first arc kind of wrapped up, and this book doesn't really start anything new, but it's its own little contained story. Um, so, But I'm going to give it a little higher because I don't think I, I'm skeptical that the series could reach any higher so i'm gonna give it an 8.5 so that's where i'm going with All it right. so so in the meantime uh before we get to the next book what is the next book called in galaxy of fear uh, i don't know i i'm outside i don't have the books all right me, listen so that's in next week three weeks next week will be back to last of the jedi whatever book seven is of that <laughs> yeah when i never said and the then book eight after us. that and book seven and eight, and then we're going to be back with book eight of Galaxy of Fear. Um, so mm-hmm. uh, that's the next few weeks for you. I, uh, once again, just want to say fuck eBay. Um, uh, you know what? I have an eBay thing that happened as we were recording this episode that I need to tell you about. I need to tell everybody about. What so book, t- book 10 of Galaxy of Fear. Right. It is ridiculously expensive. Yes. It's on Thrift Books for $136. It's on eBay for $230. So it's a make and offer. So I'm like, there's no way I would ever pay that much. So I offered, I completely lowballed it. I offered $15 for it. And the seller counter offered me, as we were recording this, I got a notification $100. Nice try. <laughs> Counter offer again. These like books twenty. Just go twenty. <laughs> yeah, I should. Yeah, I know, right? It's on the barcode on these. These books were five dollars, four ninety nine. It is ridiculous that these. That yeah, they're this not. Book, it, we're not talking the, about Action Comics number one here. It's Galaxy of Fear. Yeah, Galaxy Fear number ten, the Doomsday Ship. It seems it's and also to the fact that there's only two on the internet right now is mind blowing to me. Like, why is that one in such shortage and none of the other ones are? I don't know, but Who knows? so fuck um, eBay. Just a heads up with eBay. If you guys want to know the story, I'm just going to tell it quick since we we're going short okay, this yeah, episode. Just, might yeah. as well. So yeah, I. Uh, I was selling the 1967 Spider-Man cartoon on DVD, which has been out of print for a while and goes for a decent amount of money, between $100 and $150, generally. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I, sold, I decided to sell it. And it was, uh, I listed it for like 115 Somebody offers mm-hmm. me 110 I take the offer. Okay? And... So then I go to ship it, and it's like, 
Oh, this guy lives in Erie, where I live. That's weird. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, no. Out, yeah. And so, but I was like, whatever. Shipped it. He gets it the next day. Immediately, this is what he's, this is legitimately the excuse he had for why he wanted to return it. He said, I want to return the item. This is supposed to be the 1967 Spider-Man TV series, not a cartoon. And I was like, well, the only 1967 Spider-Man cartoon series is the cartoon. Okay. There is no live action show from that time. I was like, I'm sorry that you regret purchasing it, but I only accept returns if the item's damaged. And then, my guy files an official claim with eBay claiming the first disc is scratched. Okay? <sighs> Clearly just lying or scratched himself. He provides mm-hmm. a picture of a scratched disc up against the case. I don't know if it's actually the first disc. But I was like, okay, well, this guy clearly just scratched this shit himself, obviously. Or it's like another disc. Um, mm-hmm. And so then I file an official like complaint about the buyer with eBay. Then this motherfucker lists the item for sale. <laughs> okay? And he... Uh, like starts the bidding at 75 this was last week okay and so I was like huh and then so what I decided to do I was just like I'm just going to accept the return see what this motherfucker does so I accepted mm-hmm. the return sent him the like new postage for it and I was like well nobody's bid on this he has, he has time to get out of this take the item down and just send it back to me no harm, no foul. I'll sell it to somebody else. Because obviously if he's selling it, the disc isn't scratched. He didn't say right. anything about the disc being scratched in his description, interestingly enough. So, then I, <laughs> uh, so I, I accept the return. But then, this motherfucker waits too long. He has a bid. Okay, oh, so, no. this guy technically has to return this item to me by the 28th. But he sold the item. The item sold. So, he's fucked. Like, like, I feel like he must be fucked. I don't know. But, like, I'm going to obviously, when I get the package back, whatever he decides to send back, if he sends anything back, I'm going to Mm -hmm. go out and film myself going to the mailbox, opening the package, and, like, because, like, it'll probably be empty, obviously. And uh, Mm -hmm. hopefully then I'll be able to at least just keep my money. Like, I should get yeah, more I, money from eBay the way they fucking dilly-dallied with this shit. Anyway. So oh whatever. Oh, my God. You, uh, you, uh, yeah, at this point, like, if it gets to the... I mean, if he's in Erie, you should just bring a friend along and show up at his house and be like, where's my Spider-Man disc? Yeah, I thought about doing that, but I was just like, I don't know. Like, I looked at all his history. He had only ever bought... Like, this is the first thing he's bought this year. But he had in the past bought oh. a bunch of stuff like uh, like car parts and shit. Never bought a DVD. Clearly doesn't know anything about Spider-Man. But it's like, you know, like if he didn't know that, like, the 60s, whatever. Who, and, like, why would you, I, it makes no sense to me if you don't know that you spend over $100 on it, too. Like, that's, like, yeah, it's this complete guy's nonsense. a total and idiot. And there's a record of his messages, so I feel like that alone should be able to, like, also, it's, it's not even like I didn't say it was animated. The genre in the product description is animation. The, like... Mm-hmm. It, like, I have pictures of... Ev- including the back, which talks about it being a cartoon. Like, it, like it, the, the product description fully lays out what it is. There's It's complete bullshit. Whatever. Whole thing's horse shit. And then I, there's another item I sold where now PayPal's holding the money till it's delivered. Like, I'm, oh. like, a first-time seller or some shit, so... So pissed. God damn. Anyway. Nice. Okay, so... So sorry. It's fine, it's <laughs> fine. All right, so everybody, uh, yeah, next week, back to Last of the Jedi, back to the Jude-verse, and uh, maybe I'll have some more Marvel Star Wars thoughts, maybe I'll have some Star Trek thoughts, who knows what I'll have for you, but I'll definitely but have a have, character you, profile you, of an obscure yes. background character from one of the <laughs> Star Wars movies, so I will have a tribute to one of them. Uh, for you next week. Uh, now it's officially promised to the listeners. So, 
<laughs> all right. Yep, follow us on all social media. Uh, do all that. Like and subscribe. Five stars only. Review. Until the books are due back. The library is closed.